fertilizer, organic. Two words that seem to contradict each other. I mean, after all, you don't want to use chemicals if you garden organically, right? Well, stick around and we'll dig a little deeper. Hey, how you doing today? I'm Rick Bicklin. Today in the How to Do Garden, we're taking a closer look at fertilizer. What is it? How does it work? Is it safe to use? And what's the difference between organic and synthetic fertilizers? Let's face it, we all want healthy plants that produce lots of nutrient-rich vegetables and fruits with lots of flowers and healthy foliage, all while being resistant to insects and disease but not at the expense of having to put on a hazmat suit every time we go out in the garden or making the kids glow in the dark after eating a tomato from the garden. Fertilizer equals chemicals equals bad, right? Well, if you think back to your old high school chemistry class, you, me, everything in the world is made of chemicals. Now, of course, that's not to say that any given chemical is inherently good or bad. Well, let's look at our goal of having healthy plants. You and I need certain chemical nutrients to live, grow, and thrive. We get our nutrients through what we eat, drink, breathe, and absorb through our skin. The same holds true for plants. They just have different processes by which they eat, drink, breathe, and absorb nutrients. Not enough or too much of a given nutrient can have devastating effects on both us and plants. Even the right nutrient in the right amount, but taken in the wrong way, can be either ineffective or maybe even deadly. Eating peanut butter will provide you and me with nutrients we need to live and grow, but smearing it on our skin will provide little benefit other than making your dog really glad to see you. By the same token, I remember reading about somebody who decided for some reason to melt peanut butter and inject it in their veins. They died immediately after doing so. Plants need 16 chemical nutrients for normal growth. Let's take a look at what these are and where plants get them. First, there are six macronutrients. Those are nutrients that plants use in fairly large volumes. The first three of these are carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. The plant gets those three nutrients from the air and the soil. And those three, combined with the energy from the sun, are used by the plant in the process of photosynthesis to produce oxygen, which goes back out into the atmosphere, and also a sugar called glucose, which is stored in the plant and it's its energy store. The last three primary macronutrients are nitrogen, which is essential for leaf growth, phosphorus, it's needed for root and shoot growth, especially for young plants and seedlings, potassium, which is necessary for flower and fruit development, resistance to frost and drought, and certain diseases. Next, we have three secondary macronutrients. They're used in fairly large quantities, but not as much as the primary macronutrients. And those are magnesium, which is important to photosynthesis, calcium, which is required for plant growth, cell division, and enlargement, and sulfur, which is important in the formation of protein within a plant. And last, we have the seven micronutrients that plants need. And those are boron, which aids in sugar transport, cell division, and the production of amino acids, chlorine, which is essential for photosynthesis and disease prevention, copper, which is essential to photosynthesis also, iron, used in the formation of chlorophyll, manganese, needed for chloroplast production, molybdenum, helps plants absorb nitrogen, and lastly, zinc, which is an essential component of many plant enzymes. So as you can see, with 13 of the 16 nutrients plants need to live coming from only the soil, really any discussion about plant nutrition needs to begin with an understanding of the soil plants grow in and the plants interaction with that soil. Soil covers only 10% of the earth's surface, but within that small area, all of the world's crops are produced. It provides the anchor that lets plants grow upright and as we've seen, is the primary source of water and nutrients. Scientists have identified over 70,000 varieties of soil in the United States alone. Soil is a living and in a way breathing organism. The Penn State Cooperative Extension puts it this way, a fertile and healthy soil is the basis for healthy plants, people, and planet. 
Soil is full of bacteria, fungi, and microbes. Just a handful of soil contains more microorganisms than there are humans on the planet. By volume, 45% of the structure of soil consists of minerals in the form of weathered rock materials of different types, sizes, and shapes, 5% organic matter consisting of the decaying remains of plants and animals as well as macroorganisms like ants and worms, and microorganisms like bacteria, fungi, and microbes. The other 50% contains varying proportions of air and water which occupy the spaces between the minerals and organic matter. This space is called the pore space. Think of a jar filled with marbles. The area between the marbles is the pore space. If it has just rained, the pore space contains more water. If it has not rained, or if the water has drained out or evaporated, the pore space contains more air. Now under ideal soil health conditions for growing plants, the pore space contains equal parts of air and water. And the soil has good texture, structure, drainage, depth, fertility, and biological life. How does a plant take in nutrients from the soil? Soil nutrients are dissolved in groundwater and taken up by the roots of the plant. Water is taken into the plant both passively and actively. Water taken in passively requires no energy from the plant. Think of a sponge absorbing water. But for a plant to grow and be healthy, water must also be taken in actively. And this requires energy from the plant. Think of a pump. Remember that sugar that the plant produced and stored for energy? It uses some of that sugar to power the pump to absorb water actively. All right, now hold on tight because this is where things get really interesting. Remember those microorganisms contained in the soil that we talked about? Fungi, bacteria, and microbes? Well, plants and these microorganisms have developed a complex barter economy in the soil. For example, if I raise chickens and you raise cows, I may trade you some of my eggs for some of your milk. The plants and these microorganisms make the same kind of trades. Now, plants use most of this stored energy, the sugars, for plant growth. But up to 25 to 45 percent of these stored sugar reserves are actually traded with the microorganisms in the soil. The plant pumps some of these stored sugars down through its roots into the soil. Let's call them little microorganism donuts. And hormones, we'll call these microorganism perfume. These tasty donuts and that sweet smelling microorganism perfume attract certain varieties of microbes, bacteria, and fungi. In return, these microorganisms break down certain nutrients in the soil that the plant either can't break down itself or that it can't reach. The microorganisms get their donuts, the plants get their nutrients, everyone's happy. Let's take a closer look at some of the specific microorganisms at work in the soil. Let's start with the specific fungi that is set up shop with the plants in this barter economy. Mycorrhiza. It's from the same plant group as mushrooms. Myco is from the Latin word for fungus and rhiza is Greek for root. Put them together and you get fungus roots. Now plant roots have a limited reach. When the soil nutrients within the roots reach are depleted, the plants must use more energy to grow the roots out in search of nutrients. And this takes away from the energy that can be used to produce fruit, flowers, and foliage. So what does the plant do? Well, out go the donuts and perfume. Mycorrhiza spores are attracted germinate and actually penetrate into the plant's root system. An interconnected network of root-like tubes called hypha is now created and extends downward and outward from the plant's roots, increasing the volume of soil available to the plant to gather nutrients by up to 700% over just the roots themselves. Since plant roots are no smaller than the width of a human hair, and mycorrhiza can be as small as one-tenth to one-fiftieth the width of a human hair, they are able to extract tightly bound nutrients from the soil, they grow faster and are more flexible than roots, and they're always scanning the soil for nutrients. What about the microbes and bacteria? Well, they want in on this donut action too. They're attracted and bring in phosphorus and other micronutrients. Now, even though the air around us is 78% nitrogen, it's in a form that's unavailable to plants. What happens is colonies of rhizobia bacteria on the plant's roots take in this nitrogen and convert it into a form the plants can use. And then of course, trade it with the plant donuts for nitrogen. The USDA actually calls these little microbes 
quote, little soluble bags of fertilizer. Now all of these biological processes going on in the soil produce carbon dioxide, CO2, in the soil. Now some of the CO2 dissolves in the water in the pore spaces in the soil and forms carbonic acid, which gently weathers away minerals to release potassium and other micronutrients. Wow, that's pretty amazing when you think about it. I mean, who knew all of that was going on right under your feet? Now don't worry if all of that talk about donuts has gotten to you. The majority of the plant sugar, glucose, is stored in the plant, vegetables, and the fruit. So grab an apple and enjoy yourself. Hey, before I forget, if you find this video helpful, make sure you click on the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way you'll never miss a new video. So why did we go through that crazy science lesson about plants and soil? Well, it's really necessary to help us understand the key differences between synthetic and organic fertilizer and how each of those works. Now, like we talked about, plant nutrition refers to those 16 nutrients that plants need and use to produce their own food, those sugars, glucose. Fertilization is the term used when materials containing these nutrients are added to the soil around the plant, which the plant is then eventually able to absorb and use. Now those three primary macronutrients we talked about, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, are also the three ingredients included in most commercial fertilizers and are typically shown in the bag in the form of NPK or three numbers with a dash in between. For example, 10, 10, 10. Now those numbers refer to the amount of each element contained in that bag of fertilizer by percentage of weight. Now in our example of a 10, 10, 10 fertilizer, a 100 pound bag of fertilizer contains 10 pounds of nitrogen, 10 pounds of phosphorus, and 10 pounds of potassium. The other 70 pounds are, are mostly carrier, filler, or other components. All right, so now what is the difference between a synthetic and an organic fertilizer? Synthetic fertilizers contain extremely high levels of chemical nutrients, which are packed into small grains of water-soluble mineral salts. Now these nutrients are taken up almost immediately by plants, totally bypassing that whole plant-soil relationship we talked about. Now these mineral salts actually provide no nutritional value to either the plant or the soil, and actually tend to repel organisms in the soil. Now because you're actually force feeding these nutrients to the plant, too much can be taken in at once and burn the plant's leaves and foliage, damaging the plant. For example, a leading synthetic lawn fertilizer has an NPK analysis of 32, 0, and 4, while a good organic fertilizer will have an NPK analysis of 10, 0, 2. So in a way, plants become addicted to these high levels of nutrients and soon end their relationship with the fungi and bacteria in the soil. When this happens, the soil will lose its organic matter in living organisms, the soil structure declines, and the water holding capacity of the soil diminishes. So now your plants have stopped relying on organisms in the soil for the nutrients and basically become addicted to the chemical fertilizer. Now just like a drug addict, the plants will now require more and more of this synthetic nutrient in order to achieve the same result. Add to this the fact that the living microorganisms and fungi in the soil have died off and that the soil structure and water holding capacity have diminished. So now, not only does the plant require more and more chemical nutrient to get the same result, but the soil holds less and less of the chemical nutrient that's applied to us because it's lost through runoff and leaching. Conversely, organic fertilizers feed the soil, which is then acted on by the microorganisms in the soil to produce nutrients that the plant takes up. This activity improves soil structure and water retention by working within the natural plant-soil relationship we've talked about. Organic fertilizers are made from naturally occurring mineral deposits and organic material derived from the remains of or byproduct of once living organisms, such as composted plant material or animal manure. In general, organic fertilizers release their nutrients over a longer period of time as the chemical and biological processes which naturally occur in the soil must act on them before they are in a state that can be released and absorbed by the plant. And of course, that's where our old friends, the microbes and bacteria and fungi come in. Organic fertilizer will typically not burn plants well, because the plants don't pump any donuts into the soil until they really need a nutrient. Compared to synthetic fertilizers, Organic fertilizers contain relatively low amounts of nutrients.
However, they perform other important functions that synthetic fertilizers do not, such as improving the soil's organic component, improving its physical structure, and improving air and water movement within the soil. So what's the verdict? In the short term, a synthetic fertilizer will have an almost immediate, visibly positive impact on the plant's health. It'll have greener leaves and increased growth. But at what cost? Synthetic fertilizers create a vicious cycle of addiction and decline. They basically create little green leafy drug addicts and kill the soil. Now although an organic fertilizer will take a slightly longer period of time to have a noticeable positive effect on plant health, organic fertilizers add to and aid in the natural circle of life that's going on between the plants and the soil and the air. So circle of life or vicious cycle? Which one would you choose? I think the answer is pretty obvious, isn't it? Okay, so which organic fertilizer is best? Well, if you raise farm animals or have a large capacity compost bin, creating your own compost and mending your soil with it is a great way to go. It's basically what nature's doing anyway. Although even then, depending on your soil structure and the basic nutritional elements in it, your soil may still benefit from an organic fertilizer. Okay, so now which organic fertilizer should you use? All organic fertilizers have some form of composted plant material and or animal manure. But not all plant and animal waste is created equal. For example, here in Austin you can get a quote organic topsoil called dillo dirt. Sounds kind of cute and natural, doesn't it? I mean dillo, armadillo, that's natural. Dirt? That's certainly natural, isn't it? Well, although it is made from composted animal manure, the responsible animal is humans. It's actually the biosolid waste sludges they scoop out of the local sewage treatment plants here in the area, which is then composted. Is it organic? Yes. Does it contain nutrients? Maybe. Do I really want to spread it over my yard and have my kids and dogs roll around and play in it? Well, let me put it this way. I've walked by the bathroom door after Uncle Billy's been in there. I know what kind of shampoo, antibacterial soaps, and prescription drugs he uses, so I'd have to answer a big no. I bring this up because some brands of quote organic fertilizer are made from the same human waste compost. I will not be recommending them today. The fertilizer that I do recommend and have been using successfully for many years now is Job's Organics. Not only is Job's Organics made from naturally occurring mineral deposits and organic materials such as composted plant remains and animal manure that's not from Uncle Billy, but it also contains an additional patent ingredient called Job's Biozone. Put simply, it's a proprietary blend of microorganisms, the same microorganisms that are found in the plant soil food chain we talked about earlier, bacteria, mycorrhizal fungi spores, and archaea, a microorganism that actually cleans the soil. So not only does Job's Organics provide the nutrients for your soil to break down and then your plants to absorb naturally, it also adds the actual microorganisms that are involved in this whole process. So basically it will add to and enhance already healthy soil and it provides the microorganism building blocks to help return life and health to poor soil. They basically take the guesswork out of selecting a fertilizer by having organic formulations specifically designed for different types of plants including tomato and vegetable, annuals and perennials, azalea, camellia and rhododendron, fruit and nut, fruit and citrus, palm, rose and flower, and holly, and all purpose. I've included a link to their Amazon store below where you can find whatever you need, order it, and have it delivered right to your front door. Now as a disclaimer, Job's did pay for my trip to their media event up the road in Dallas recently, as well as my room and board while I was there. But the opinions expressed in this video are my own, and influenced by nothing more than the science behind plant and soil health and my own years of successful experience using Job's Organics. In other words, if I had found that they were feeding me a line of bulls, uh, let's say fertilizer, I would have thanked them for having me and just done a nice video about Brussels sprouts or something. Hey, thanks so much for stopping by today. I hope you found this educational and useful. Have a great day. See ya.